analytical chemistry one lesson 18. whenever chemical substances are mixed together they undergo reactions to produce some other compounds reactants turn into products they never turn completely into something new they always react until it's a balance between the remaining reactants and the newly formed products this balance is called chemical equilibrium the arrangement of, and energetics of electrons in atoms and molecules uniquely defines their chemical behavior. When such a species is placed in a reaction vessel, a beaker for instance, the potential for a chemical reaction has increased. Every atomic and molecular species has a certain chemical potential. When it is added to a reaction mixture, it increases the overall chemical potential. For our more common reaction conditions of constant temperature and pressure, the chemical potential is defined as the partial molar Gibbs energy. That is, it tells us how the Gibbs energy changes with an infinitesimal addition of each particular species. Now, what happens in a chemical reaction? Well, iodine can be used to titrate for hydrogen cyanide in an aqueous solution. The reaction is this one. Now, we can imagine starting off our reaction in a beaker with just iodine and HCN. The vessel has a certain propensity, a certain potential to undergo chemical reactions. We allow the reaction to start, and when the first iodine molecule reacts with the first HCN molecule, they are both essentially removed from the vessel, lowering its chemical potential. However, at the same time, three new species, ICN, I- and H+, appear, and they contribute their own unique chemical potentials to increase the vessel's chemical potential. If the chemi overall chemical potential has been lowered by this reaction event, then that means that the loss of chemical potential as the reactions combined was greater than the gain in chemical potential by the appearance of the products. When this condition applies, then the same reaction occurs again. This continues. The reaction proceeds. Each reaction event, the reaction equation occurring once, involves the loss of chemical potential due to the loss of reactants and the gain of chemical potential due to the generation of products. If we restrict our conditions to that of constant temperature and pressure, then changes in chemical potential are just changes in Gibbs energy. When a reaction event occurs, there is a small change in Gibbs energy, delta G. For a single reaction event, this would be a very small number, probably measured in attojoules per event. On the other hand, if we consider a very large system such that when a mole of reaction events occurs, they do not substantially change the concentration of everything in the reaction vessel because it's so big, then we can think of the, the change in Gibbs energy when a mole of reaction events occur. We would report delta G in kilojoules per mole, for instance. As long as delta G remains negative, the reaction events in the forward direction will continue to dominate. While the occasional reverse reaction event may occur, that would be in the uphill increasing potential energy direction, and the system will, on average, continue its descent to lower chemical potential to lower Gibbs energy. Recall from first year that changes in Gibbs energy is a combination of both enthalpy changes that will largely come from the energy absorbed by breaking bonds and reactants balanced against the energy released when the bonds are formed in the products, and entropy considerations. So recall the equation. This means that the change in chemical potential when one reaction event occurs at the beginning of a reaction is not the same as when the same event occurs when the reaction has proceeded substantially. The entropy is continually changing as the number of each species changes. So while at the beginning the chemical potential may decrease a lot for each reaction event, the change becomes smaller as the reaction proceeds. Finally, a point is reached where the chemical potential lost by reactants in a reaction event is exactly balanced by the chemical potential gained by the products being formed in that event. At this point, we are just as likely to observe a set of reactants combining to form products as we are to observe a set of products combining to form reactants. The condition of chemical equilibrium has been reached. Think for a minute about the chemical behavior of an iodine molecule in our reaction. We can call its behavior its activity. Consider just a single molecule. Would its ability to react be different if it was submerged in an ocean of hydrogen cyanide compared to being lost in an enormous crowd of I2 molecules with only a few HCN present? What if the solvent was changed from water to methanol? What if the temperature was increased? There's a lot of things to consider. We start with defining a reference condition. We call this the standard state. Activity is now measured against changes from this standard state. Every substance has a molar chemical potential for these defined standard conditions. Standard state data 
is indicated with a superscript symbol, either a degree symbol or what's known as a plimsoll symbol. There remains some uncertainty in usage. IUPAC approves using both. With improved typesetting, using the plimsoll symbol has become easier, but both are acceptable. The activity of each species is measured relative to their standard state activity. Activity is, therefore, defined by this exponential relationship. We can turn this equation around and also write this logarithmic expression. Each species in the reaction has its activity given by an expression like this. We can add them together for the total chemical potential of the system. When the reaction proceeds, there is a change in chemical potential. The reactant terms decrease, terms are subtracted, while the product terms increase, they're terms that are added. Consider our reaction between iodine and HCN. When we are interested in the change in chemical potential for the reaction proceeding in the forward direction, we could write the following. Now, by what you know about logarithms, you can combine them into a single term to get the following expression. We can call the argument of the logarithm of the reaction quotient Q. And now, when we restrict our conditions to constant temperature and pressure, we have recovered our well-known relationship that, uh, between changes in the Gibbs function and the reaction quotient. So what about this activity? If we do not have the chemical potential, is there another way to determine it? Activity can be described as the effective concentration of a solute. In an ideal solution without any of these extra complicating factors, we know that concentration is the controlling property. Double the concentration, double the chemical reacting power. Activity can then be defined relative, again, to the chemical strength of some reference condition. The activity is less than one when the concentration is less than that under the reference conditions. It is more than one when the concentration is greater than that of the reference standard state. We include another term, however, that accounts for all of the non-ideal behavior. A coefficient labeled gamma is the activity coefficient. It depends upon concentration, solvent, temperature, pressure, ionic strength of the solution, and anything else that is pertinent. Here, C0 is the reference concentration. It depends upon how we define it. We might want to work in molarity, and C0 would be defined as being one molar. We might want to work in molality, then we would use one molal for C0. Once we have chosen the standard state for concentration, the values for the activity coefficient, the chemical potential for Gibbs energy, all assume their unique values. But our standard states must also align with the data that we will be using. It is important to make sure that the tabulated data you use is drawing upon the same standard states as that which you will be using. Here are the key standard states that are very commonly chosen and will be what we are working with in this class. For solutions, the standard state will be one molar. For gases, the standard state will be one atmosphere. Now let me say that scientists are increasingly turning to using one bar for the standard state for gases. The difference is small but measurable. One bar is equal to 100 kilopascals, while one atmosphere is equal to 101.325 kilopascals. When we have a solid substance, whether crystalline or amorphous, we select its standard state to be that of the solid itself. This means that its activity is itself, divided by itself, which is of course just one. The same is true for pure liquids. Their reference state is themselves, and their activity ratio is also just one. In the case of solvents, when solute concentrations are small, then it is close to being itself as a, a pure liquid, and so it is treated similarly with an activity of one. As solute concentrations increase, this becomes a weaker approximation, but for our purposes, we will make the assumption that solvents are also pure liquids.